makes it real easy to pick up a fish. It's hard to be a fish nowadays with all the technology we have out there. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get rolling here, guys. And uh, as we get started, the first few minutes, we'll give out raffle tickets. But then once we're five minutes or so into this thing, we'll just keep rolling through the seminar. So only those of you who showed up on time or a little bit late uh, will have a chance to uh, win those free trips at the end of the giveaway uh, or at the end of the seminar. We're going to give away a five-hour half day for two guests, 10-hour all day for two guests as well. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about some nearshore and offshore fishing. If you haven't got a raffle ticket yet, come on up. So uh, the big thing that we want to try to discuss, guys, is uh, nearshore and offshore fishing, but we can do a little bit of everything. And the goal here is to make it more of a fishing conversation. What's up, man? Uh, so that way I'm not standing up here talking at you. Uh, I'd rather be talking with you. So if you guys have a question at any point during the seminar or uh, talk here, don't be afraid to uh, raise your hand and ask. Uh, that way, again, it's more of a fishing conversation is what we're going for. Hey, Cliff, can you give a uh, ticket to the gentleman and the lady who just walked up? Sure. Thank you. Um, so by way of introduction, y'all, my name's Captain Dylan Hubbard from Hubbard's Marina. Uh, we do deep sea fishing and near shore fishing on party boats and charter boats here inside John's Pass at Hubbard's Marina. Uh, so we have a variety of different trips, uh, near shore and offshore from five hours all the way to 44 hours. Plus we do some uh, private fishing charters as well. So a lot of different options through Hubbard's Marina. We've been in business since 1928, uh, nearly four generations and uh, nearly a hundred years now. Uh, we do those uh, near shore and offshore fishing trips for grouper, snapper, and a little bit of everything in between. So today, I want to try to share a little bit of tips, tricks, knowledge, uh, info with you guys, and again, kind of make it like a fishing conversation. So I always like to kick these things off and talk to you guys a little bit about what's going on now and what we're seeing now and kind of what we're looking forward to. And then from there, hopefully you guys have some questions to lead this conversation down a path, all right? So right now we're in the middle of uh, summertime. The water is extremely hot, air is extremely hot, and we're really focused on snapper fishing. Uh, red snapper season's in full swing, and the summertime means those snapper are spawning. So uh, generally this time of year, our mangrove snapper, our yellowtail snapper, a variety of snapper species that we target and catch a majority of are all spawning. So that means they're generally easier to catch they're more aggressive, they're in bigger concentrations, um, and our red snapper obviously is only open for a very short period of time. This year was June 1st through end of day August 18th for us, so we've got a few more weeks here to target those red snapper and kind of take our revenge for the last few months that they've been closed. And then from there, on the back side of red snapper season, we're going to kind of transition into hunting those red grouper, those mangrove snapper, yellowtail snapper, some more of those gag grouper. This year our gag grouper fishery is open uh, June 1st through the end of the year. We've got a lot of red grouper we're catching. We're doing really well on some scamp, uh, some mangroves. So offshore really focused on mangrove snapper, red snapper, gag grouper, uh, red grouper, scamp grouper. Near shore we're more focused on those lane snapper, mangrove snapper. We're seeing some red grouper, some keeper red grouper, a lot of unfortunately short or juvenile red grouper. And uh, then we're also seeing near shore plentiful of those uh, gray snapper or white grunts. Uh, hog fishing isn't that great in the summertime when the water's hot. They get really spread out, really leader shy, really lethargic, and they're much more harder to, or they're much more difficult to target. Whereas once the water cools down, we start getting those cold fronts, they really get concentrated on the ledges and they're a lot easier to target. So right now, this time of year, not so much the hog fish thing, but we are seeing some pelagics offshore deep water. We're still catching a few kingfish here and there. Uh, we see the mahi-mahi from time to time, this time of year, and then uh, blackfin tuna and potentials for other things as well. But most of the time, this time of year, pelagic bites are typically a little bit fewer and further between. Uh, because the water is so hot. Spring and fall is kind of the hot time for pelagics. So as far as what we're looking forward to, what I look forward to is those cold fronts starting again. 
and uh, the water temps just start dropping, everything to kind of ease off, and uh, that really gets fish moving around. People ask me a lot, what's your favorite time to fish, or what's the best time to fish? In my opinion, the best time to fish is when you're available. You know the saying, you know, if you're too busy to go fishing, you're just too busy. Well, it's really true. A lot of people will ask, when, when's the best time? What's the best moon phase? What's the best, I mean, if there's a cold front coming, what does that do to fishing? If you get too wrapped up into all the variables, and then you gotta coordinate your schedule with your buddy, with your, with your other half, with your kids, it makes it really tricky to find a time to go fishing. Whereas if you kind of boil it down to, hey, I'm not too busy right now, let's go fishing, then it's a lot easier to get out there on the water, and a lot of times, even when one variable is off, you'll still have an opportunity to catch fish, and it's always good to get out there on the water, right? Um, but to answer the question, when's my favorite time to go fishing, is definitely those mixing periods of spring and fall. Uh, I had a phone call from a guy the other day. He's like, well, I'm a local. I don't fish in the summertime or in the springtime. It's too hot and the fishing's not good. I, I, I don't, I only fish in the wintertime. And then I had a phone call like 20 minutes later. Well, I'm a local. I don't fish in the wintertime. I know fish don't bite then. And it was, I literally was just so comical to me because people have these really strong opinions uh, based on past experience or based on what their dad or their grandfather or their grandmother taught them. Uh, and they, you get these like t uh, blinders on about this is the only time to go fishing. And the same thing with spots on the boat. People all like, well, I, I can't get a spot on the stern. I'm not going. It's like, what? I would never fish the stern of the boat personally. I always fish up towards the bow of the boat or along the sides of the boat. Or again, just like the other example of, if there's a spot open on the boat, I'm gonna go fishing because it doesn't matter where you fish on the boat, it doesn't matter what time of year you're going, a lot of times you have just, a good, just as good of a shot to catch plenty of fish. Uh, it's just right place, right time, and the people who catch the most fish are the ones that have their baits in the water longer. That's what it comes down to. Now, we are uh, into this a little bit, but I saw some people walk up here. We are giving away something at the end, but you have to have a raffle ticket. So this is our last time we're gonna give out these raffle tickets. So if you haven't got one yet, come on up and grab your raffle tickets, guys. Um, so as, uh, as I was saying, I like to kind of start off with a little bit about what's going on now and uh, what we're looking forward to. So that's kind of what we covered there. As uh, everybody's picking up their tickets here, if you guys have a question or if you have a topic that you guys want to discuss more, uh, please go ahead and don't be afraid to raise your hand. Okay. She's, she's got a kid in her hands, I believe her. <laughs> uh, there you go, sir. So does anybody have any questions? No questions, huh? You want me to just keep rambling? What about talking about mangrove snapper? Mangrove snapper, I like it. So mangrove snapper are one of my favorite fish to target. And the reason why is they're a very smart, very uh, kind of uh, leader shy, intelligent fish. It takes a little bit more effort to catch a mangrove snapper consistently and often compared to a variety of other fish, especially compared to something like a red snapper. If you have a bait in the water and a red snapper's around, you've probably got a good chance of hooking them. They'll bite anything, they're super aggressive, they're kind of dumb. So uh, red snapper are easy to catch and it doesn't take much skill. And in my opinion, I, I don't like fishing for them as much for that reason. If you're deep enough, if you're far enough from shore and they're there, Whatever you put down, from a, from a jig to a, a, a hard plastic, soft plastic, to a, a live bait, dead bait, it doesn't matter, you're gonna have a good shot at it. Whereas a mangrove snapper, very, very tricky fish. They can be there and you won't catch them. And we see it all the time on like say, for example, a 10 hour trip. On a 10 hour trip, a lot of times we'll only catch a handful or two of mangrove snapper. But then you'll have a 10 hour trip where there's some people going out there that know what they're doing, that use the right tackle, that really target them, and they'll come back with eight, 10 mangrove snapper because they're using the proper tackle, the proper techniques, the proper bait, and they have a really good shot at catching a lot of them. And the 39 hour trip, a lot of times you'll have a, a whole swath of people going, but the people that go a lot, 
the people that go 5, 10, 15 times a year or fish a lot on their own boats or what have you, and they have the right tackle, they have the techniques down, they'll come back and they've caught a limit of mangrove snapper, a two-day limit, 20 mangroves. Whereas other people maybe struggle to get close to that number uh, or even have half of that number because mangrove snapper will separate an experienced angler from an inexperienced angler very quickly. It's a good kind of litmus test. And that's what I would encourage you guys, not, I know that might sound discouraging, but I would encourage you guys to focus on that and really try to get the mangrove snapper game mastered. And that skills, those skills that you learn mastering mangrove snapper then transfer to all other species. And really all other deep sea fishing. Because the big thing with mangrove snapper is making sure you feel the bite because they're very quick biting. And sometimes they can really just very lightly bite, whereas other times they hit it like a grouper. So it really gets tricky to catch them consistently and catch them often because sometimes it's that light bite, sometimes it's that difficult bite, sometimes they'll come up and pop it and then come back and actually eat it. So there's a lot of kind of uh, difference in the way they feed. So it makes it tricky for that reason. To answer your question though, for mangrove snapper, uh, it kind of is different near shore versus offshore. So near shore, just we'll go ahead and lay these out now so we're all on the same page moving forward. Near shore is different and you ask 10 people what their definition of near shore is, you'll get 10 different answers. So for me, near shore means from the beach out to 20 miles, or from around 30, 40 foot up to about 100 foot. Offshore is beyond 100 foot, beyond 20 miles. So for the purposes of today's seminar, near shore is inside 100 feet, inside 20 miles, offshore is beyond that. So for mangrove snapper especially, there's a big difference. It's almost like a wall there because offshore mangrove snapper, I'm gonna be always using a conventional reel. Near shore mangrove snapper, I still would normally use a conventional reel, but a lot of times I'm gonna have a spinning reel in my hand. And again, everybody has different terminology, so we'll just clear that up too. Conventional reel, spinning reel. And for me, a conventional reel is always gonna be preferred. Every single time, you won't catch me dropping a bait to bottom with a spinning reel if I'm offshore. If I'm past 100 foot, past 20 miles, almost never gonna be dropped, 99.9% .9 of the time, not gonna drop a spinning reel to the bottom. Unless it's a situation where I'm out with my buddies, we got like four people on the boat, and you're drifting over a, 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 a deeper pod, or deeper, deeper rock pile, or flat hard bottom, and you're not the rig fishing, or you're anchored up and the current's really light, and you don't have a lot of people on the boat, uh, then I might break out that spinning rod and knock a rig or, or free line a bait or something like that. But putting the weight on it, dropping it to bottom, not going to see me doing that offshore with a spinning rod. And the reason why is just physics, leverage. Because when you catch a fish with a conventional rod, take, take the railing out of it. The railing is a whole other ball game that we can talk about. But just the physics of how you hold this rod. So the butt of the rod underneath your right arm, left hand out in front of the reel, my right hand's on the reel. So when I'm fighting the fish, I'm lifting with my whole body. I can lean back and my, my rod tip's gonna start leaning with me. I'm fighting that fish with both arms, shoulders, and my whole upper body. A lot of, lot of uh, even, I should say, a lot of weight behind it. Uh, but you have basically your elbow should go into your gut and that is basically connecting your rod to the, your torso. So see how I tuck my shoulder in and that's connecting my elbow to my gut and that way my arm's not lifting this rod. My body is lifting this rod so I can bend my legs. So now I'm fighting this fish with my arms, my shoulder, my torso and my legs. You're not fighting the fish with one arm. Whereas with a spinning rod and reel, you're only fighting that fish with one arm, one bicep. 
is all you got to fight that fish with. There's nothing more you can do. So a spinning rod and reel does not give you the power. Even if you spend the money, there's new spinning reels like this one right here in my hand. One of the most expensive reels I have up here. It's got 65 pounds of drag. It's a 4,000 series rip spinning reel. It's crazy. Would have never imagined so much drag can go into such a small platform. But it is physically impossible, even world's strongest man, to be able to lift 65 pounds with a fishing rod with one arm. Because this rod bends, the rod stretches, trying to lift dead weight off the ground. You'd think someone really strong, even stronger than myself, or as strong as some of you guys out there, gals, could be able to lift a lot of weight up, but you really can't. And I experienced that firsthand uh, with a kayak fishing trip that we used to do uh, on our boats. We did this kayak mothership trip where we'd load up a bunch of kayaks, head offshore, we'd put the kayaks in the water, and then send these people out in their kayaks to fish 40 miles offshore. It was really, really cool. But one of the things we did to kind of test them out is we didn't want to take any, anybody out 40 miles and drop them off in a kayak offshore. We made them go to a tackle shack up on 66 and they have a pull out back where you can test the kayaks. And so we made them sit in a kayak and we hooked a, uh, a fishing pole to a, a five pound weight at the bottom of the pool. You gotta be able to lift that five pound weight. That was, that was our litmus test to see if they could handle it. No one could do it. And we're like, wait a minute, we might've made a mistake. And so we, then we tried from the side of the pool, standing on the concrete, trying to lift the five pound brick off the bottom of the pool. I couldn't do it. Even standing on the ground, it is very difficult to lift that amount of weight with one arm. Whereas a conventional rod, no problem. Almost four to five times more weight. And that really opened my eyes at a young age, seeing that firsthand. It was really, really incredible, just the physics of how that works. Plus, you take into account that on a Coast Guard inspected vessel like ours, we've got tall railing heights. We've got 48 inch railings or 36 inch railings. So if a real big fish is on here and I'm getting schooled, I'm gonna drop down to one knee and I'm gonna put the foam of this rod right in front of my reel on the rail. And now all of a sudden the rail is the lever. And my body becomes the counterweight. And now it's just the rod fighting the fish, not me. So this is a huge bailout if I get a really big fish off. That spinning reel, you can't do that. You got no shot. If he's dogging you, you've got no bailout except for to watch him pull your drag and pop you in the bottom. So spinning reel versus conventional, definitely a big kind of uh, first step is picking the right tool for the job. So for mangrove snapper offshore, I use a conventional reel. Now we just talked about why and you need more power and you're sitting there thinking like, hey dude, a mangrove snapper is a small fish. But what happens a lot of times? You're fishing for a mangrove and you hook up with a gag. Or you're fishing for a mangrove and you catch a red grouper or a red snapper. You want to have the option to land that fish, the ability to land that fish. And that's why a conventional reel is important. Also, I mentioned earlier, who catches the most amount of fish? The person with their bait on the bottom the longest, right? That spinning reel takes you longer to reel that fish in. You're not as efficient. It takes more time from point A to point B, whereas this conventional reel, I've got a heavier weight on it, I've got more power, I can get that fish up quick, off the hook quick, and I'm baited and back down to the bottom before even myself fishing next to me, if I clone myself with the spinning reel, you know? Twice as fast with that conventional, and that's another reason why. Then it comes down to uh, what tackle choice is. Offshore, I'm going to be using a fish finder rig, which is a fish finder rig to me. Uh, people call them Carolina rigs as well. It's a slip lead or an egg sinker rig, so that way it can move up and down my main line. And then a swivel and about a four to five foot leader and a double snell rig. That's going to be my setup for mangrove snapper offshore. And I'm going to be fishing dead bait with it, a uh, thread fin chunk or sardine chunk head tip head cut off, tail cut off, both of those double snell hooks into that piece of bait. Whereas in, or excuse me, near shore, inside 100 foot, most of the time uh, I'm gonna be using that conventional rod setup that I just showed you uh, with a little smaller hooks, a little smaller weight, a smaller chunk of thread thin or sardine. But a lot of times I'll also be using a spinning rod and reel. 
And with this setup for nearshore mangrove snapper, you could do the same thing uh, with a double snell rig and a small chunk of thread fin, uh, rig knocker rig style, or you could just do a single hook rig with a live shrimp. Live shrimp is a great option near shore for the mangrove snapper. Once you get offshore, I personally wouldn't mess with the shrimp because even myself, I'm pretty good at feeling that hook down there, but those shrimp just come off the hook so easily and it would just get super frustrating to be using shrimp in deeper water. So shrimp is kind of an option for me if I'm fishing 60, 80 foot of water or less. If I'm fishing past, much past 60, 70 foot, I'm not gonna be using shrimp. Even for mangroves, I'm gonna be using a small chunk of thread fin and putting two double snell hooks in that thing. Uh, but a knocker rig style setup on the spinning rod and then a Carolina rig or a fish finder rig setup on the uh, conventional rod. Another thing to remember with the mangrove snapper is hook sizes. A lot of people will come out there with those four X strong hooks. That's all well and good guys, but that makes it really difficult to hook that fish because a 4X strong hook has a very thick wire barb. It's like you, my thumb. Whereas one of those thin wire hooks is gonna be more like my pinky. You're gonna have a lot less diameter there. It's the difference between using a 125 pound test and 20 pound test. The thinner wire hook is sharper. It's gonna go in more easily. Just like you go to the doctor and you get a, a shot. Do you want them to use that little baby needle? Do you want them to use that big honking like horse tranquilizer needle, right? It's the same idea. Thinner wire hooks go in a lot easier, a lot quicker, and uh, you're gonna, your hookup ratio is greater. But then, you're, you gotta balance that out with the thinner the wire hook, then all of a sudden you don't have as much power. It can break easier, it can straighten easier. So you gotta kinda find your happy medium. Me personally, I really like the owner hooks, the Gamagatsu hooks, uh, Mustad makes a couple good versions, and that's kinda what we carry in our shop, is the ones that I like fishing with. That's what I try to do in the shop, is only bring in the stuff that I like. But Bass Pro Shops has their Offshore Angler series of hooks, and they match the owners almost exclusively. I think it's made by owner. Kind of like your Publix cookie is made by Oreo, it's the same thing. Uh, so the, the Offshore Angler hooks are one of the ones I use a lot as well. I think I got a good number of the mangrove snapper stuff in there. We'll keep moving a little bit. Good question. So I was having this debate the other day at ICAST. Uh, for me personally, uh, and I, I've been accused of being too uh, dead set down the line, but for me personally, I think there's uh, one way you should really try to teach yourself to fish because a lot of these newer tackles, they charge more for the kind of less uh, demanded setup. Like for example, this conventional reel. A lot of conventional series reels don't make a left-handed retrieve. The only, one, the only company out there that makes left-handed in all their models is accurate. And you have to order them most of the time because tackle shops don't have them and they charge you more. It's like $150 more for that left-handed setup. Whereas spinning rods and reels, the lot of the new spinning rods and reels, or a lot of the new spinning reels uh, out on the market are incorporating new technologies like mag seal and all one piece frames and a lot of really cool technology that makes them real stronger and more resilient and perform better but it makes it to where you can't reverse the handle anymore and so that's becoming more and more commonplace and a lot of the new tackle I saw this week at ICAST was that way where you can't flip the handles from one side to the other so to answer your question most spinning reels you can flip from one side to the other. This one, I don't even know if it does because I've never tried it. Uh, so I would encourage everybody out there to try to force yourself to learn. There's, for me, there's a, a right way to do it and then there's the other way to do it which makes it a little bit more tricky because you have trouble finding tackle. So for me, when you're using a conventional reel, you reel with your right hand. When I'm using a spinning reel, I'm reeling with my left hand. And so it's not whether I'm right-handed or left-handed. Spinning reel, the handle's on the left. Conventional reel, the handle's on the right. And so me personally, that's how I do it. So that way, it doesn't matter what tackle shop you go to, what boat you're on, 
That's how it's going to be. Spinning reels are always on the left. Handles of conventional reels are always on the right. So it makes it a lot easier for you to fish other places, buy tackle. It's going to save you money in the long run. If you can try to train yourself to fish that way. But it is a little tricky, I understand. Like a lot of people that are right-handed, when you hand them a spinning reel, they try to turn the handle to the other side. I'm like, what are you doing? You got it, you're right-handed, you, you still reel with your left when you're using a spinning reel, and then you reel with your right when you're using a conventional. So it's just one of those things, everybody has their own preference on it. But to answer your question, I don't know if this reel does, but some models still do. What I find that a lot of those newer model stuff that have like those mag seal drags, a lot of those don't flip over. So it makes it a little bit more tricky. Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Yep. So for pier fishing, uh, if I was going to go fish, like say the Skyway fishing pier, uh, most of the fishing around there, I would be using a spinning reel just because I have better casting distance. Um, you can, uh, it's hard to overhand cast. Some piers don't let you overhand cast. So then a conventional reel would probably be a little bit more apt. It depends on the type of fishing you're doing. So if I was gonna go fish the Skyway, I'd probably bring both. And the spinning reel, I'd have a little lighter tackle on. I'd be fishing for like mangroves or sheep's head or, or casting for Spanish mackerel. Whereas I'd have the conventional reel uh, for big baits under the pier and bringing out like one of these guys for shark fishing or live grouper fishing under the pier. Uh, and a lot of those bridges in the Keys, they have some pretty big snapper. They have the live grouper, you have tarpon down there. So I would still have a conventional reel. And a lot of times, like if I'm on a vacation and I'm, I'm what I call tourist fishing, you go out there and you don't have anything, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what's out there. Uh, I always like starting small with a lighter tackle set up and catching something that I can then turn around and hook up for bait on my bigger rod and reel setup. So that, that makes it fun too, because you're like fishing for your bait and then you set you catch stuff and put it on that bigger rod and set it out there. So it's kind of up to you, but me personally, in a pier fishing situation, I would probably have a little bit of both. So that way you can pick the right tool for the job based on what you're seeing out there on the pier that day. Because you might get out there and the water's not really moving, there's nothing really going on. Yeah. If the water's moving really fast at a pier, uh, there's really not much you can do about it. I mean, the old adage, time and tide waits for no man or woman. Uh, so really, if the current's running really strong, you want to use a, the reason you get hung up a lot is because you get dropped to bottom and then the current pulls your weight along the bottom and then you're eventually going to hit a snag. So what you could do in that situation is use heavier weight and you go to the up current side. So if this sign is the pier and the current's going this way, you're going to pass up current against the current. So that way, by the way, the time your weight hits the bottom, it's right on the leading edge of the bridge there. And then you're using a heavier weight, that way it's gonna hold bottom. If you drop it down and you feel that weight rolling, and it's not holding bottom, it's not heavy enough. Because as it rolls, it's gonna hang you up. Eventually you're gonna catch something, hang up on something. Yeah, and you don't want it rolling across the bottom. So you want a heavier weight, you wanna cast up current, and then keep that stationary. Or you use like a, a spinning rod and reel with a really heavy casting uh, lure, like a, a gotcha plug, and you cast it as far as you can up current, working with the current. What I see a lot of people doing in that situation, like even in John's past snook fishing, the current's rushing out. So we're standing on our dock, and the current's rushing out, it's rushing this way in front of me. That means I'm never gonna cast this way. So if you cast this way, by the time you start retrieving that lure, the lure is then working against the current. No bait fish is strong enough to swim against that current. So when a fish sees that, even if you pull it across the biggest, most hungry fish ever, he's not gonna hit it, because it doesn't look natural. If the current's running this way in front of me, I'm always gonna be casting as far as I can this way. So that way, by the time I start retrieving that lure, I'm working it slow, because it's already getting pushed by the current, but I'm working it slow with the current, so it looks natural. If you cast way up current, then you reel back real fast, 
all of a sudden with the current and the speed of the jig returning, it's swimming too fast. It doesn't look natural again. So you gotta think about the current, present your bait in a way that it's gonna look natural and it's gonna be in the strike zone. And fish, whether you're on a pier, on a dock, at a jetty, or you're 100 miles offshore, fish always have their nose in the current. They're always looking up current at what's coming at them because they're opportunistic feeders. They were waiting for those bait fish to come to them. So they're positioned in a way trying to expel, expel the least amount of energy possible. So like on a bridge, if this is a bridge piling and this current's going this way, where's that fish gonna be sitting? He's gonna be sitting right here, the back side of that piling, waiting for a, a bait to come around the side of it. He's gonna stick his nose into the current, eat that bait and go right back to chilling in what we call the lee of the current. So it's the same idea and that's why you wanna cast way up current and by the time that bait hits the bottom, it should be right here at the base of the piling. So that way that fish sitting behind the piling can look over and be like, oh, what's he doing there? Come over and eat him, you know? So that's the idea that you want to kind of approach it with is you got to think about where that fish is sitting. And you want to make sure your bait's in that strike, strike zone as naturally as possible. Right. You said the English are responding this time Yes. Do they move like your so spawning behavior in mangrove snapper, what they do is they congregate uh, and they spawn in big spawning aggregations or congregations. And they generally occur offshore. Now, Tampa Bay is unique because it's so big. We do have deep water areas of Tampa Bay. And I believe wholeheartedly we still or we have spawning aggregations of mangrove snapper inside Tampa Bay. You got to think about the shipping channels 40 and 90 feet deep. Yep. So in the summertime in Tampa Bay is one of the better times to target the mangroves on those bigger rock piles. Um, but they definitely get harder if you're not fishing around those aggregation sites. So like where you normally catch mangrove snapper in Tampa Bay, if they're not there, that means they're probably grouped up somewhere in a higher concentration around the bay. Deeper water or around the shipping channel, some of those rock piles, some of the mitigation sites around the Skyway, a little bit outside of Egmont Key, around the, uh, the parking lot area, uh, down uh, outside the channel, that big mitigation site on the pipe. The pipe is a great area to fish if you can find a little rock pile around it. Um, but there, there's definitely a lot of mangrove snapper inside Tampa Bay right now. But just like the nice woman was asking earlier, you've got to time your trips around the tides. So an inshore charter captain right now, what they do a lot of times is, A, they don't fish during the day, the heat of the day. 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., you won't catch those guys out in the charter unless they have to be or something's going on, you know. Most of those guys are fishing like 5, 6, 7 a.m., and they're off the water by noon, 1 o'clock. And or they're fishing at night, or they're fishing around sunset, and they're fishing the tides. So if you're trying to fish 7 a.m. to noon every day, there's gonna be days where the tides aren't right. And so when the water's moving, that's a better time to fish the flats. You want water moving, docks, and areas like that. You want a little bit of water moving. You wanna catch those salooner, major, and minors. So you wanna look at the tides before you go and make sure you're catching the start or end or kind of peak tidal times. A lot of times around a new moon, it's an incoming tide, uh, full moon, outgoing tide is the general rule of thumb, but to me it's any moving water, as long as you're catching those salooner, major, and minors. And then when it's not optimal, that's when you're mangrove snapper fishing. When that current slows down at the end of an outgoing, it gets to be slack tide, then it's a, an incoming tide, or end of an incoming, it's gonna be slack and then going out going tide, the water stops moving so fast, that's when you go hit those piers, bridges, rock piles in the middle of Tampa Bay for mangroves. So when the water's moving real fast, really hard to fish 40 foot of water with a light tackle set up and a jig head with a piece of shrimp or those mangroves and those rock piles. But the slower tide times, that's a good time to hit. Yes, ma'am? Yeah. Yeah. Keep asking really good questions. 
but I keep giving you really bad answers because my answer to that one is both. And the reason why uh, mono versus braid, which one is better? I would say both because there's different applications and there's different levels of kind of what you need. Inshore, when I'm fishing a flat, uh, casting a lure, never, ever, ever will I fish anything but braided line. Braided line is the truth when it comes to casting distance, getting out there farther, faster, but you have wind knots. So a little tricky to start with, like my son's rod and reel, really hate myself that I put braided, on, braided line on it because it causes a lot of problems when you're not really paying attention to it. Um, so experience level comes into it a little bit, but casting distance, fishing the flats, fishing inshore, gonna be braided line all the time. Bottom fishing for grouper offshore, never ever ever do you need braided line. Really 99.9% .9 of the time, mono is all you need. One thing you'll notice is my big, big spinning reel, that I, or my big conventional reel, sorry, that I use for grouper fishing, amberjack fishing, that's all mono, no braid in there. Uh, now, same thing doesn't apply to, like, say, my snapper fishing setup. There's mono top shot, but it's mostly braid in that spool. Because me personally, learning over time of how to feel the bottom, how to feel the bait, really paying attention to my line, making sure others around me where their lines are at, and being able to feel if someone else's line starts touching mine, then being able to reel up and get out of the way before I get tangled up, I can get away with using braided line. And generally go out there, even if the boat's busy during red snapper season, get out there and not get tangled up. If you're not so, as, as, if you're not so experienced offshore, if you're just getting into it, start with mono. You want to learn how to fish using that mono, monofilament line really no real reason to use braided line for bottom fishing until you're getting out there to 250, 300 foot, 400 foot, 500 foot, then it becomes more necessary to use braided line to feel the bite. But if you're inside 150 foot, which is 95% of our trips, you really just need mono. Especially when you're fishing for grouper, amberjack, anything that's gonna come up and hammer that bait, no reason that you need to braid it on. But when you're fishing for something like a mangrove snapper out there in 200, 250 foot, it becomes a little bit more helpful to use braided line. But nowadays, with the type of tackle that we have in our hands, if you're using a nice fishing rod, really braided line becomes almost obsolete because you can feel what's going on through your rod. And what a lot of people, I think a lot of mistakes occur is picking the right rod. So some of these reels nowadays can get really expensive. Uh, I mean, some of them are upwards of $400, $500, $700. And you've got to remember the general rule of thumb is you want to invest as much, if not more, in your rod than you do your reel. So when you're looking at that $600 two-speed reel, keep in mind your rod is going to be as much or more expensive in reality but it's really hard to find a $600 rod. I, I haven't had much success, nor am I looking for one, but uh, a custom rod and reel, I mean, you're gonna look at a rod that's gonna be 300, 350 bucks, and that's gonna be a really good rod to give you the sensitivity that you need to overcome that issue of being able to feel the bite. And I can feel whether or not my bait is still on my hook in 200 foot of water, but that's because I'm using that higher end rod. If I was using that $100, $120, $150 rod, it becomes a lot more difficult to feel whether or not I have bait on the bottom, whether or not someone else's line is touching my line. Whereas a nicer rod and reel is going to help you a lot in being able to increase your sensitivity, feel those bites, hook up more, more uh, effectively, and catch more fish ultimately. So definitely I don't remember the question, but uh, definitely uh, it helps. Which line, Which line you prefer? So back to that, uh, mono mono works overall. If you're bottom fishing uh, with natural bait, dead bait, live bait, 100% of the time you'll be using mono, unless 
you get real, real experience when you're going into deeper water, or you just want to try something a little different. But really, it would be awesome if I could say, all right, everybody only uses mono, and if that wouldn't cause problems, we would. Uh, today, this morning, off the 39 hours, someone came up to me, you got a band braid on these boats, man. No more braid. And I get that from a perspective of if you get off a trip and you get to take it with your neighbor a few times, it's frustrating. But some people can use braided line and be super effective and catch a lot of fish with it. And there's some applications in which you need braided line. Like, for example, when I'm slow pitch jig fishing, you have to have braided line because these little baby reels you use don't have a lot of line capacity. And you need braided line to put the action on the jig properly. So there's some applications in which you do need to have braided line which again is cast in on the flats, slow pitch jig fishing, vertical jig fishing, fishing deep water past 300 foot of water. There's some applications in which you need braid. All the other times it's gonna be mono. to answer your question. In the back. So uh, live bait, dead bait, artificial lures doesn't change. Um, I think, again, it kind of is an ambu ambiguous answer like it was before. It depends on you, and it depends on your application and what you want to do. Uh, some very experienced anglers can catch fish the same on artificials as they can a live bait or dead bait. Now, some people can do both really well, and it depends on the fish. There's some days that that fish doesn't want to hit a jig. And if you throw a live bait in front of them, free line, a light tackle, you're gonna get hit immediately. There's other days where they don't want a jig, they don't want live bait, they're lazy, it's hot, right now the summertime is it, they want dead bait on the bottom. Like for example, a redfish. A redfish right now, they're tucked up underneath the mangroves at high tide, sitting in the shade of the mangrove Attention roots. Well, We're gonna take a break for a second. They're tucked up in the shade of that mangrove root, and they're not gonna come out and chase the lure you drag by the mangrove roots. And they're not gonna really go after that live bait that's hanging two, three, four feet from the mangroves. But you skip a piece of cut mullet, or cut pinfish, or cut breadfin up underneath the edge of that shaded line, and it sits there on the bottom for a few minutes, you're gonna have a much higher chance of catching that redfish. And the same thing is true offshore. Some days, that big gag isn't gonna chase that live bait. He doesn't want that dead bait. Maybe he wants that jig danced in his face. Other days, maybe he wants that big dead bait. So you really don't know. And what I always suggest to people is sticking to the dead bait most of the time. But you gotta remember, in our application, if, I was, if you asked me that question and I had blinders on talking about bottom fishing only, I would say trying to be the first down to the bottom with that big live bait, that uh, slow pitch jig or vertical jig, <coughs> is a good idea. Because a lot of times that big fish, that big aggressive gag grouper on the spot, he's alpha. And he sees that big bait going to bottom, he's gonna come out of his rock and slam it. Because he's aggressive, he's going after that thing. Whereas the smarter fish, the females are hanging back gags, or the big, big gags are, are male. That's why I'm making the joke. It's not to be excessive. But the, the smarter fish are hanging back, and uh, they're going to they're gonna be a little bit more timid. They want to see what's going on first. They're going to be a little bit slower. The gag grouper, especially because they're a smart fish, a lot of times a gag grouper will take five, ten minutes of looking at your bait before he hits it, or she hits it. Whereas a lot of times that first really big fish is going to come in the first five minutes of the spot, or sometimes the first bait that makes it a bottom gets that really big bite. So you you gotta kinda think about it, but generally 99.9% .9 of the time, if I'm bait fishing, I'm gonna be dropping down a dead red fin. Cut head, cut tail, double snow ring. But if I see someone catch a really big grouper, I might switch to that big rod and drop a big live bait or switch to the slow pitch jig. Or the very first part of the stop, I wanna be the first one down with a big live bait or a jig and then I'll switch back to the dead bait. So to answer your question, yes and no. <laughs>
but it, it comes down to experience and what you're good with. Where you gotta remember an artificial lure is really only as good as the person working that jig. And it really takes a lot of skill and experience to catch fish with artificial lures consistently and often. I said earlier about mangrove snapper, that's the litmus test for experienced fishermen and someone who can catch mangroves consistently and also and consistently and uh, all, all the time is a more experienced angler. It's the same thing with uh, artificial lures. I have a lot of respect for someone who can go out there and catch fish consistently with artificial lures. So that takes a lot of experience, a lot of practice, and a lot of skill, and a little bit of luck. <laughs> Any other questions? When you're out there and you're drip fishing with uh, a lead like this, do you usually free line it out and thumb on it, or do you just lock it because you're talking about a gag or something and yeah. look at it for five minutes? Yeah. Because the problem I end up having is if I let it free line, I'll cook something. Yeah. Next thing I know, I'm, I'm in the rocks and I'm busted off. Yeah, so his question about uh, if you're drip fishing, do you just free line it out there? Uh, what do you do? And if you get, if you just let it free line, uh, and you finally do get a bite, you're going to get hung up. And the reason why is you get what's called scoped out. If you get scoped out, that means you're, I'll show you instead of trying to explain it. Uh, so you drop down, a lot of times you're going to be dropping down, and your line is straight up and down. That's how you're bottom fishing 99% of the time, right? Your line is pretty much straight up and down. But what happens sometimes is like if you're uh, drifting, you can get what's called scoped out. Scoped out just means that all of a sudden your line is at a, a lower angle, like this, where your line, or a higher angle, excuse me, lower angle. I don't know. Matt is my strong suit, I'm just kidding. If you're further out like that, then all of a sudden that fish has a greater chance of getting to the bottom. If you're straight up and down, you pull him off the bottom, he's off the bottom. If you're way out like this, you can pull him off the bottom 20 feet. He's still only five feet from the bottom. You can pull him 20 feet from where you originally caught him, he's still only five feet from the bottom. So when you're way out there and scoped out, that fish has a greater ability to get, watch out, Cliff, there's a hook on the ground by your foot. I'll be a fish. <laughs> so you gotta be careful when you get scoped out that you're running into that, that chance of a higher chance of getting hung up in the bottom. But to answer your question, what do you do when you're drift fishing? Uh, and to hold bottom, what I try to do, if I'm drifting, the best place to be on a drift generally is the up current side, in my opinion. I like the up current side because my bait's going to see the fish first. So this is my boat, and we're drifting. Uh, you guys are looking at the front of the boat. The logo's the front of the boat, and the, uh, the stern's facing me. And we're drifting to the starboard side of this boat. So my right your guys is left. We're drifting this way. So what's the up tide side? This side. Exactly. This side is the up tide side or up drift side. So you're, excuse me, no, I got that wrong. So we're drifting this way. That means this side is up, up drift side. So you want to try to cast away from where the boat is and where the boat's going. So that way the line's coming at you. So if we're drifting, I confuse myself with that. Uh, so this probably isn't the best idea. But if we're drifting this way, this means this side of the bucket is going to be up tide side. Because if you cast out up here, your line's going to start going underneath the bucket, right? So as the same idea, if we're drifting this way, your line's over here, your line's going to get scoped out, right? It's going to be further going further away from you. A lot of people hate being on the up tides or up drift side because your line starts going under the boat. I get complaints about it a lot. The whole day my line was going under the boat. I want that side of the boat generally because that gives me the ability to cast out away from the boat and get up current and the fish are seeing my bait first. My bait's the first one they're gonna see. So that gives me a little bit of that opportunity I talked about earlier. That big aggressive fish sees that bait come down first, he's gonna come up and smack it. So I'm the first bait he sees because I'm casting up drift. But it is Definitely class 102 uh, to learn how to cast these conventional reels. They're not as easy to cast, but you can easily learn by practicing it. Only underhand cast on a party boat, well, even on a, your buddy's boat, never overhand cast, catch a center console or something behind you. So you've got to underhand cast or 
if you're closer to the water, you kind of side cast, but you can get a lot of casting distance out of these rods. So you cast way up tide, up drift, and what you're doing then is if you happen to be on that side of the boat, and even if you can't cast, you just kind of try to lob it out there or even drop it straight down, it's the same idea. So once you, once, uh, what happens when you do that, all right, so we're casting way up, and I'm pretending to be on that up drift side. So the leads come at me. So I've cast it out, I hit bottom. But what's gonna happen is, as I get closer to that lead, my line's gonna get slack. So unless I do something, my line's getting slack and I can't feel the bite, right? So what I would suggest doing when you're on that side is once I get cast out and get set on the bottom, is as the lead drifts to me, I'm gonna walk. Because on the boat would be drifting, but I'm gonna walk. As I drift towards that lead, I'm bringing my rod tip to the sky so I can feel the bait and feel the bite, but I'm not disturbing the lead. So let me do that to where you guys can see it a little bit better. So there's my lead. Now keep in mind, that's an egg sinker. So it's gonna roll if I put any real tension on it. But as I drift towards that lead, I'm keeping my line tight enough to feel the lead, but not disturb that lead on the bottom. So if I get a bite, I'm gonna feel it. And did that lead move? No. So I'm holding bottom, I'm presenting that bait naturally, and I'm making sure that I'm feeling the bite because I'm slowly lowering my rod, just tight enough to feel the lead but not disturb the lead. Same holds true on the other side. To prevent getting scoped out, or the idea of what you were talking about as I'm moving away from the boat. So now we're gonna do the uh, opposite. So now I'm on the other side of the boat, my line's going away from me. So what happens in this scenario is, as your lead moves away from you, you do the opposite. So I drop down, when I drop down, I purposely start with my rod ridiculously high. And then as, I, as, I, as the boat drifts away from that lead, I just slowly lower my rod tip. Then once my rod gets too low and I'm having trouble making sure that I'm not moving that lead, I just grab and reset and then keep drifting. And then once I do this once or twice and I start to get too scoped out where I don't feel comfortable anymore, reel up and reset. Also, once you get more scoped out, you don't feel the bite. The more line in the water, the harder it is to feel the bite. So once you do that once or twice, you gotta just reel up and reset. And that's part of drift fishing. And I get that complaint sometimes too, is I had to keep reeling up. I can't, I can't get a lot of fishing time. Well, that's part of drift fishing. You're covering more area. Kind of like, kind of why Power Pole, Rodan, Minn Kota, they're billion dollar companies because they sell a lot of trolling motors. Why do you want a trolling motor on a flat? Cover more air spot wash. Get out of here. <laughs> Who invited you? <laughs> no, you know, on, a, on a grass flat, is, was my example, uh, you want to cover more ground. That's why you want a trolling motor. So a trolling motor allows you to cover more ground, show your bait to more fish, and generally you have more fish caught, right? It's the same idea of drifting. Drifting allows you to show your bait to more fish, generally catch more fish when certain applications, like for example, when you're near shore fishing for white grunts, gray snapper, a variety of different heads and tails, drift fishing with a small cube of squid is the most productive thing. So like on our five hour half day trip, fun for the whole family, that's what we're targeting. So we primarily drift fish, we catch more fish, like three to one more fish drifting compared to anchor fishing. Offshore fishing for a little bit more quality fish, red grouper, red snapper. If you don't have that one hot spot, drift fishing is a great target and technique for you to do in a private boat. As you learn different areas, find those hot spots, drifting is a great idea. Like drifting the pipe, drifting areas like the middle grounds, you'll catch a ton of fish. Uh, and it's easy because you don't need necessarily that hot spot, that special spot, but as you're drifting, Make sure someone's paying attention to the bottom machine in case you drift over that hot spot, you can mark it. And it's a great way to find new fishing spots too. Because all of a sudden you catch a lot of fish, you mark that spot, you go back and kind of look at it, you'll notice there's a ledge somewhere around there. Or there's a pothole you didn't know about. So drifting is a great area to find new fishing spots, show your bait to more fish, and be more successful. 
10 years ago, 12 years ago. I'm, I'm, I'm 30 now, so when I first got back from college, uh, I was uh, 18 years old, working full time on the 10 hour trip. We would drift fish all day long for red grouper. We catch 45, 50 head of red grouper on a 10 hour all day. And that was a pretty normal average day. A really good day, we're catching 75 red grouper drift fishing in 40, 50, 60 foot of water. Nowadays, we don't drift fish at all. We're always anchor fishing on those 10 hour trips. And generally, we're targeting hogfish for a majority of the year. And this year, or this time of year, we're tar targeting those mangroves and lanes because our red grouper fishery just isn't what it once was. And red grouper near shore, 40, 60, 70, 80 foot, drift fishing is the way to go. Catch a ton of them over those big, large areas of hard, flat bottom. But we just don't have that fishery like we once did. It's 110, 120 foot right now, you can catch a ton of red grouper that way. But it's a little bit trickier to find those hard, hard areas. And, and drift fish in deeper water is a little bit trickier. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So first time anglers, young anglers, start with the near shore trip. Inside 100 foot, inside of uh, 20 miles, hook them up with the spinning rod and reel, a uh, three, four out hook, uh, one two ounce egg sinker and a small cube of squid. They'll be hooked on fishing for the rest of their lives. They'll catch a, they'll have a bunch of action, they'll get a lot of bites, they'll catch a bunch of those smaller good eating fish. But you catch a little white grunt on a spinning rod and reel, it's not much for some experienced anglers, but it's good eating, and it pulls hard on a spinning rod and reel, and it's a lot of fun. I bought my son uh, a little uh, crappie fishing rod. It was like a, a 2000 series spinning reel, and dude, you hook a pinfish this big on that thing, you, thought, you think you got a man. It's all bent over to the butt, the reel screaming, drag. It's a ton of fun. I sat, 45 minutes, my son wasn't even out there. I was fishing off the dock <laughs> for a pinfish. It's like, I hope no one sees me, but it was a lot of fun because it's light tackle. And so that would be my suggestion for first timers, get them out in a half day, get them out in a 10 hour, put small cubes of squid, small hook, light tackle, 30 pound leader. We'll have a lot of action, we we'll catch a lot of fish. We'll get the hang of it quickly and we'll be hooked. Whereas like you could take that same person bring them out there and put a conventional rod and reel in their hands with 60 pound tests and a big thread fin. They might catch a couple of fish, but they're not gonna have as much action, harder to feel the bite, it's a heavier setup. It's just not as much of a quality experience, where if they get a lot of bites, it's a lighter rod and reel, it bends more, they're gonna have a lot more fun. They're gonna more likely be hooked and wanna come back, at, come back down and visit you again. Any other questions? We got time for one more. Oh, yeah. There we go. Um, yellow tail. Yeah. 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 Yellow tail are tricky around here. Um, in the Keys, yellow tail fishing is huge. In our area, there's a select number of captains that I would suggest to you to go yellowtail fishing in a select time of year. This is that time of year though, summertime. Uh, we have some trips where we catch a lot of yellowtail. We have other trips where we don't catch as much, and that's generally the direction. Out of John's Pass, if you head west or northwest, your chances of yellowtail go down dramatically. Yes, if, if I head southwest, a good distance, more south than west, I'm going to catch a lot more yellowtail. Now there's some areas out there that I catch a ton of really nice yellowtails, uh, but getting them chummed up on the surface out there in deep water takes a lot of effort, a lot of know-how, a lot of skill, and once they're up there, you'll catch a lot of them, but unfortunately in the day and age that we're living in now, sharks show up and then it's over. Yeah, yeah, so, and that's what's happening in the Keys too is those guys down in the Keys who have made a living historically fishing yellowtail, they can't catch them anymore because of the sharks. And uh, that came up at the council meeting. It's like, why aren't, why aren't the commercial fishermen catching their yellowtail quotas anymore? A lot of them just gave up, sold their boats, or retired because they can't catch yellowtail anymore because every yellowtail you hook, the shark gets it. Because in order to get them up to the surface, you've got to chunk. 
Once you chum and you sit, sit in a spot for a while to establish that chum line, sharks are on you. So it becomes a little bit more tricky, but we catch a lot of yellow tail bottom fishing. Um, and it's generally this time of year, kind of late spring through early fall, and it's generally well offshore, 120, 140 foot, and it's generally when we're fishing to the west or southwest. But yes, you could definitely catch them here. They're one of the better eaten fish we catch that do not hold well though. So that was probably true of what, whatever you heard is, if I caught a yellowtail, that'd be yellowtail, vermilion, porgies. Those are the fish you eat right away. They don't hold very well. Kingfish, same thing. Another quick one, anybody? Now guys, uh, I appreciate everybody coming. Uh, now keep in mind, we do have, uh, through Hubbard's Marina, we do our uh, Sunday night live stream show every Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. So if you didn't get enough, at 8.30 p.m. tonight, we're gonna be live on our Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch, Trovo uh, pages, and we're gonna be talking fishing for an hour tonight. And during those live shows, we show you pictures of what we've been catching, talk about the weather for the upcoming week, and then we answer your questions, just like we did today. But you text in your questions, and then I answer them live on the show. Uh, and then what I don't get to, I try to get back to and type your answers. Um, so that happens tonight and every Sunday night at 8.30 p.m. through the Hubbard's Marina Facebook page, YouTube page, Instagram page. Make sure you check it out. And then also our website has a lot of information on it. So we filmed today's seminar. That's gonna get put up on the website here in the next week or two. We've done a lot of seminars here and they're all filmed and on our website. We have pages of hour long seminars on our website. And also our Sunday night live stream show, each one of those are recorded and put on the website. And we have a whole fishing tips and tricks page where it boils down a lot of what we talked about today, the double snell rig, how to target mangroves, hog fishing tips and tricks, how to hook a bait on a double snell rig, how to brine a bait, how to cut a bait. All that information is on the fishing tips and tricks page, a little bit more condensed down in kind of topical videos. So there's a lot of information on our website. Plus, if you're sitting out there, you've got your own boat, you never plan to fish with us, there's still information for you on the website too, like the, fish, the weather links, the, the fishing weather links. There's a lot of information there. There's a lot of information about fishing regulations. A lot of helpful info, fishing reports. Even if you don't fish with us, or even if you do fish with us, the fishing reports are all super helpful. So check us out, hubbardsmarina.com. Look us up, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Make sure you give us a follow. And uh, we're gonna give away that five hour half day for two guests and that 10 hour all day trip for two guests here shortly. But I believe Cliff has something to say before we get there. Hey everybody, I, I know a lot of you guys are part of our club, our club. And I want to make sure that you that you're Unfortunately, we gave out the last week about 10 minutes in. Sorry about that, man. No problem. I got, I got time. Okay, I'll be here.